Welcome to the UNL Chemistry video series. In this video, we are going to talk about spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is the study of the interaction between matter and electromagnetic radiation. What is electromagnetic radiation? Fundamentally, electromagnetic radiation is a type of radiant energy that is embodied as an oscillating electric and magnetic field. The type of spectroscopy that we are going to focus on in this video deals with the visible region of electromagnetic radiation, more commonly known as visible light. Here is a full electromagnetic spectrum. We can see that visible light only takes up a sliver of our spectrum here, right in between infrared and ultraviolet frequencies, spanning from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. Various substances that we encounter in everyday life have color. The color comes from the substance's ability to absorb light in some regions of the visible spectrum while not absorbing light in others. Take this green jello here. This green jello does not absorb light in the green spectrum. This is why we see green. The green light is what makes it to our eyes. Actually, this jello is absorbing light in the red region of the spectrum. Likewise, orange juice does not absorb light in the orange region. It actually absorbs light in the blue region, allowing our eyes to see the orange light, and therefore orange juice appears orange. To better understand this phenomenon, let's look at a basic color wheel. If a substance absorbs a specific color, then the complementary color, the one directly across on the wheel, is the observed color of that substance. The complementary color of green is red, so our green jello absorbs red light. The complementary color of orange is blue, directly across from it. Again, why orange juice is orange is because it absorbs blue light. What about this cuvette with red liquid in it? What part of the spectrum is being absorbed? It has to be its complementary color, green light. When a substance absorbs visible light, this is done by the promotion of electrons to a higher energy orbital within the atom. Since these energy levels are quantized, only certain energies of light will be absorbed by the atom. While we typically picture light interacting with matter much like waves hitting the shore, light interacts with matter in a very different manner. Light can be thought of as quantized packets of energy known as photons. These photons can be absorbed by atoms and promote an electron to a higher energy level. Then that electron releases energy in the form of light as it drops back down to a lower energy level. This is, of course, all on a very small scale, but how can we account for this on a macroscopic level? This equation, known as the Beer-Lambert Law, or simply Beer's Law, relates a substance's ability to absorb light to its chemical properties. In the lab, you are going to make several dilutions of a dye. You will notice that the most concentrated solution will be the darkest, while the more dilute solutions will get lighter and lighter. Beer's law predicts this quite clearly. Let's define the variables. A is for absorbance, related to the amount of light absorbed. Epsilon is the molar absorptivity, related to the efficiency of a substance to absorb light. B is the path length of the light or distance the light must go through and C is the concentration. We will talk about epsilon and B in a few minutes, but for now let's say these variables are constant. Focusing just on the concentration and absorbance, what happens to the absorbance if we dilute the most concentrated solution by 50%? The absorbance will decrease by 50% as well, right? Because there are more molecules for the light to be absorbed by in the concentrated solution, we will see very little light come out the other side. But if we dilute that solution, there are less molecules for the light to be absorbed by, and therefore we are going to see more light come out the other side. This trend will continue all the way down the line. Now, what happens if we hold the concentration of the substance constant and increase the thickness of the material for the light to go through? Using Beer's law, this means B is increasing because B represents the path length of light, or the distance it has to travel through the material. If epsilon and C are held constant, and we double the thickness, notice that absorbance will double as well. Each time I put a cuvette down in front of the others, less light is allowed to pass through the sample. Because I'm increasing the number of molecules the light comes into contact with as it passes through the substances, I am increasing the amount of light that is being absorbed by the material, and therefore less light is making it out the other side to my eye. In the undergraduate lab, we use the SpectroViz to take spectroscopy readings for us. 
Here is how this device works. We start off with the light source. The light source is directed through our sample into an entrance slit. Once the light passes through the slit, it is sent to a dispersion device that spreads out the light in a spectrum to be analyzed by a sensor. Let's see how our dilutions look on a spectrograph. We will start with the most concentrated one. With absorbance on the y-axis and wavelength on the x-axis, we end up with an absorbance spectrum like this. Does this make sense for a red dye? Well, the peak of the absorbance is happening at 498.7 nanometers, which is in the green spectrum of light. So yes, this makes sense. 498.7 nanometers should be our analytical wavelength, or where we take all of our absorbance measurements from now on. Let's try this again with our 50% dilute solution. Pause the video and make a prediction of where the absorbance spectrum will end up. Remember Beer's Law. The absorbance dropped from 0.750 to 0.377 at 498.7 nanometers, which is about half of our original. Did you predict this? Let's see what the other three dilutions look like. Remember to get the absorbance from the analytical wavelength. Each one is about half the absorbance of the previous sample. This makes sense because we diluted each one by 50%. From this data, you will need to make a calibration curve. This would be a plot of your absorbance at your analytical wavelength versus the concentration of your substance in molarity. Notice your y-axis is the exact same, but it's at a specific wavelength. This should make a straight line. Don't forget to include the equation of the best fit line and the correlation coefficient, the r-squared value, on your graph. Now, if you have an unknown mixture of dyes that has an absorbance of 0.422 at 498.7 nanometers, you can now find the concentration of the red dye in that substance using the line equation generated by your graph. All you have to do is plug in the absorbance, 0.422, for the y variable, and solve for x. You can also do this with Beer's Law. We talked about A being the absorbance, B being the path length for the light to travel through, in our case this is one centimeter because this is how wide the cuvettes are, and C is the concentration of our substance. All we need now is epsilon. This is a constant known as the molar absorptivity constant, which is specific to our substance. We can find this number in our linear equation from our calibration curve. This is my line equation generated by Excel. Recall that the line equation is simply y equals mx plus b, and m, your slope, is the molar absorptivity with units per molar per centimeter. This number is the last piece of the puzzle in order for you to use Beer's Law and get an A in this lab. I hope this video helped you better understand light and spectroscopy. Good luck in the lab, and happy data collecting.